Okay, let's roll. Uh, so we're going to talk redundancy today, and uh, obviously there's all kinds of redundancy that we can talk about. Uh, but I think today I want to kind of stay focused on just uh, how you guys are setting up your redundancy to happen if you have a console crash. You know, that's, I mean, that's obviously going to be the one that we're going to really, that we're all really scared of out into the world. What happens if my console goes down? How do I continue to have audio uh, for the audience so we don't have these big swaths of silence while we're rebooting or whatever we have to do, right? And, and obviously the challenge in all of it is coming up with the right kind of redundancy scheme. I think you'll see that uh, in thematically through the day, uh, you know, that we can get to quickly, that can, you know, that can keep the show going while we do something in the background, uh, you know, so that we don't have silence, you know, that, and how do we build redundancies kind of with that agenda in mind? Uh, you know, we can, we can talk about all kinds of other redundancies at another point, maybe, you know, of network redundancies and, you know, what we do with PA system, et cetera, but we're going to stay primarily focused on the mixer today and how to keep the show going there. And I will freely admit, uh, I haven't given this a whole lot of thought about what monitor guys do in this situation. You know, it's easy for us as front of house guys, because really all we got to do is provide, you know, you know, for all intents and purposes, a stereo mix, and we can keep the audience entertained. But how you would uh, set up, you know, multiple ear mixes redundantly for a console failure, I am, I am all ears to how you guys are doing that. So uh, let's kind of get it all started here. If you get, guys, if you haven't muted your mics, please mute your mics in the background. If not, I'm going to do it for you because I hear all the conversations going on back there. Uh, I'm apparently just going to have to do it, which is fine. There we go. All right, here we go. All right, so I'm going to, you know, I thought maybe the way to start the conversation is just going to show you what we were doing on... Um, the, 20, the last Petty Tour, the 2017 uh, Petty Tour. So here, what you're looking at right now is just a block diagram, signal flow diagram of our redundancy scheme there. And keep in mind, this is only dealing with redundancy for the mixer, uh, you know, to keep it going in the event that something would go down. So just to kind of set this up a little bit and let you know uh, kind of how this is working here, you know, we, again, and it, you know, I, I, again, you guys are going to get tired of hearing me say this. You know, this all plays back to this idea of using submasters, and this is another advantage uh, to using submasters in your system. At least in the SXL system, it turns out to be an advantage here. Because what happens here is uh, I can take those audio submasters, be it drums, groups, or drums, bass, uh, guitars, whatever. Please mute your mic, Angelo, if you're in. And uh, I can take those and send them out the stage rack, right? And once I do that, if the control surface fails, if I can even shut down uh, the control surface if I need to do it, uh, that audio will continue to pass out of the stage racks, right? So that opens up a lot of options for us there. Uh, you know, obviously, if you were mixing without submasters and sending a left right out somewhere, you could send that out the stage rack and it would continue going on as well. But I wanted to retain some version of mixing uh, in the event that the, the surface went down. So uh, just to kind of get all the parameters in play, if the surface were to fail or it needed to shut down, uh, you know, this would be very much like it used to be in uh, the original venue systems where we had a backup personality, right? Uh, in this situation, your plugins would continue to pass audio. Uh, you know, the unfortunate part is any channels that are muted are going to stay muted. Uh, any channels that are open are going to stay open. Uh, overall, input fader positions are going to remain where they were, uh, etc. So the, you know, there's it, it's not like it's a, any some kind of perfect, perfectly mirrored redundancy scheme that is tracking everything you do, and we just switch over to the B system. Uh, we were never going to uh, do that primarily because of the cost, and secondarily because a system like that really didn't exist at that point. Uh, so, you know, my idea was, well, let's take all the stems out, let's take all the groups out, and then we'll take all the vocals individually out at the post-insert 
fader point of the vocals. That way, when it comes into the second console, I'll have full control over it, and channels that were muted or unmuted will be irrelevant in terms of the vocals. I can make sure and get vocals up. And as I take you through this block diagram and, and show it to you, the other thing to remember or kind of keep in mind is we kind of put in place uh, you know, essentially two levels of redundancy, right? Where we could have re a redundancy where if the surface failed, uh, et cetera, I could move over to a second surface and continue to mix the show. And then we had a third version of that where if the failure got deeper, we could rely on audio from the monitor console to come back into the, con uh, back into the third console and allow us to, uh, in a much reduced feature set, still mix the event. And then the final version of that is we just take an output from the monitor console directly to the PA system uh, and bypass the front of house console entirely, right? So uh, that was the idea there. We, we wanted to be able to uh, kind of cover all of our bases with regard to the mixer. So in this situation, uh, you can see the S6L system is in play there. Uh, I used an S3LX uh, system as uh, my redundant mixer here. And partially because I used it for a lot of other things during the show as well, it just seemed like a natural fit uh, to be able to use it as the redundant mixer. All it required was that we add more stage racks and we could, we could get a much closer match uh, to what we were doing on the SXL in terms of uh, output processing and things like that. So we, we got it where this, you could change over and not really tell which console you were on. We got it pretty doggone close. And then the final piece of the puzzle, as I said, is we were taking stems from the, the monitor console as a, as a last resort before the, the ship goes down, so to speak, right? Okay. So let's uh, kind of zoom in on this piece of it here. This is our first level of redundancy here. So if we zoom in here, you can kind of see there, those are all the uh, subgroups uh, transporting over to the S3L. Uh, it's all post-insert, so it's not necessarily following what fader position I had on the SXL. It's coming above the fader, so I had full fader control of the overall group level in the S3L. And then uh, post-insert vocal direct outs uh, that would go over to the console as well. And we chose intentionally to use analog to do this. So we took analog outputs of the stage rack uh, and sent them over to the analog inputs of the S3LX. And we did that really just primarily so we didn't have to even consider any kind of clocking issues or anything like that. If we if it required some sort of reboot and reclock that would happen, we wouldn't have to experience that uh, in the S3LX. Let me make sure I can get the chat up here where I can see you guys too. I want to make sure I'm not missing something here. Okay, so, and by all means, jump in if you've got questions on any part of this here, uh, but it'll get more detailed as we go. So the second level of redundancy uh, in the event that we were going to do this was with the monitor console, right? So uh, I just had Greg, our monitor guy, um, build a set of stems off of his console, uh, and I would kind of listen to them, and, I, you know, I actually kind of came up to the console and got it sorted out to something that I thought was going to be usable. And then we took analog outputs from his system as well and brought that into analog inputs on the S3LX. So we had two you know, significant levels of redundancy there. Uh, and I just broke it up into kind of music and vocals, uh, backing vocals and lead vocal there. It was basically four inputs or four outputs uh, from him to be able to deal with it. But at this point, we're still mixing on the S3LX there. Uh, I, I don't show it in diagram here, but we also had a stereo, a full stereo mix uh, set up from Greg that we could patch directly into the front end of the PA system through the LM44s if we needed to do it. All right, so there's the analog going back in. And this is just kind of a very simplified uh, drawing of it. We were doing gain sharing at the point at that point, so uh, you know, each of us had access to inputs and outputs there. Uh, but it was literally just taking that and switching it over to drive the PA system. I'll give you a, a more detailed look at that in here in just a second, too, and give you an idea of how, how long it would take to do that. All right, so this is kind of the changeover. This is how the changeover would take place. We took advantage of the LM44s here uh, and their ability to do this pretty quickly. Uh, we had a lot of LM44s in the front end of the Anya drive system. It was all Dante driven. So you can see we had a Dante output uh, from S6, uh, S6L here. 
And that was the primary drive into the PA system, even though it went through LM44s to get there. Uh, we did that to facilitate uh, uh, the redundancy here. So you can kind of see the uh, primary and redundant Dante going to the uh, main uh, input uh, LM44 up there. And it, take a look at it here. So uh, the second level uh, of the thing, uh, the deal was coming in from S3LX via AES. Now we took AES outputs from uh, the S3LX to go up into that lake as well. And we were set up, if we needed to do it, to take analog outputs into the analog portion of the uh, LM44 as well. Uh, we were set up to do it, but we never really followed through with it. I, in hindsight, if I had it to do all over again, I probably would do that. Uh, I think if I remember right, the reason we didn't do it is because we took that last portion of Greg's uh, redundancy, meaning the direct outputs from the monitor console, no, uh, no front house console at all, into the analog inputs of the LM44. If my memory serves me right, that's what we did. I don't, I don't know if we updated this drawing on it or not. But that way we had, you know, two console, well, th yeah, three console possibilities at front of house and a fourth possibility from uh, being directly driven from the monitor console. All right, so um, that's that guy. Uh, and we can stop there for a few questions if you want. Sorry, Sean, I'm going to let you in late there. Uh, you know, just to talk about that, because that, that actually worked really surprisingly well. I, I was amazed at how how easy you could pull a mix together that sounded very much like the mix coming off the S6L uh, in that situation. And of course, the idea was you lost uh, re, uh, snapshots and you know plug-in control and all that stuff. But I think it's important to remember, always remember your agenda with these redundancy schemes, right? The idea is not that you're going to be, you got to be good enough to mix the rest of the tour on the redundancy. You've got to mix the rest of the night or maybe even a portion of the night, right? So it's just got to get you by. It's just, you know, we got to get something on the head wound here to stop the bleeding, and then we'll get back to what we normally do. So that should help you kind of prioritize how you design some of these systems. Carlos, you've got a question, man. Go. Let me hear it. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious if you ever had to switch during the show. Uh, let me think. You know, I don't think we ever did on Petty. I, I think the only time we ever had to switch over on this was actually on Mud Crutch uh, when we were out doing that. That, that was where we kind of tested this whole scheme because that, that whole tour for me was just kind of a, uh, a test case on whether I was going to take S6L out on Petty anyway. Uh, so we tried it there, and there, was, there were two incidents on that uh, particular tour where we had to do that. <laughs> Ironically, it, they both happened at the Encore, and... We switched over to the S3LX and were able to get the S6L back online before they came back out for the Encore. So we switched to it, never mixed on it, came back to S6L and, and got it back on. So, yeah. But that said, and we'll, we'll cover this a little later in the, the Prezo here, we, we checked it every single day. Switch over, put it in virtual sound check, and mix on it and make sure it's going to work every day. And uh, like I said, we'll talk about that. It's, you know, my take on it is it's not a redundancy scheme if you don't rehearse it and check it before every single show. Just like for your spare vocal for your lead singer, it's not a spare vocal unless you've checked it, right? So same thing applies for redundancy here. Uh, Scott Taylor, you're up. Um, do you remember, I don't remember when exactly it was, but apparently there was a time when your console went down. I think it was on Petty. It wasn't the Mud Crutch Run, but it was actually on Petty. Do you remember that? Like I, I was at Sound Image when we had to get you another console for some reason. I guess my question is, if you remember that, like what actually happened in that case? I just remember it going down and us having to be, you know, in like a rush to try to get you a new console and everything. It was back when they first like came out. You sure that wasn't on Mud Crutch? Well, okay, so here's the, the interesting part is I was out with the shelters right before the mud crutch run went out. I don't think it was that because I didn't end up doing the run with you guys. I just did their solo run. I, I don't think it might have been that, but I don't think it was that one. I thought it was actually you were, you know, mixing Petty. 
I don't. I don't. I, my memory is that of it is that we didn't ask for a console. I, I remember at one point we needed extra stage racks out there, uh, but I don't remember it being a console. I mean, we only we only had two failures on that tour, and one was a a stage rack failure, which we ended up finding out was a software bug at one point. And then we had the show go down in Seattle uh, at Mariners Stadium, but that had nothing to do with the console. That was that was a, an actual actually a human error. Uh, it wasn't a console issue. Okay, because I just remember getting like preparing a console for you and everything. I, got, I, we I gotta believe that was on. I gotta believe that was on Mudcrutch. I don't think we had that happen. All, I, I, look, it was a lot of brain cells ago. I, very possible, but I have no memory of it. Don't at least I don't remember it. So any, okay, so let's say it was cro- mud, the mud crutch. This is what was going on. What you were talking about. Yeah, in that situation, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was that caused it, uh, but we ended up having to recycle a surface. Uh, it was in, uh, where were we at? I think we were in New York where we had to recycle the surface, and we were thinking that there was something wrong with that surface uh, at that point. So I, that's why I think it was probably that tour, uh, but I, again, I can't be positive on it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, so um, so the next the, the drawing you have up, I, I really just kind of put this up there to, uh, Mike, I'll be right with you, uh, just to kind of show that you don't have to use an S3LX to do this. You know, if you're trying to save money, and again, just make sure that the show can survive, you could still use that, that same kind of scheme of using uh, submaster stems and you know, vocal outputs, et cetera, out to a little analog mixer, right? I mean, you could do it just something that simple and still probably get a good enough result to keep the show going for some length of time, uh, you know, just to keep things going. I, I would just take the outputs of that and patch them into the analog uh, inputs of the LM44 or whatever device I'm using and be able to switch over within that, uh, that piece's, you know, uh, software to be able to do it. So it can be done. And, uh, you know, it kind of speaks to the idea of if you're not doing this, the question is why not? Seems awful risky to go out in this in the world in this day and age with not without having a redundancy scheme built and ready to go. Mike Shapiro, go ahead. Are you there, Mike? You'll need to unmute your mic if you're speaking. Sorry about that. That's all right. If you're if you're sending drive from a local 16 in front of house to an LM44 and your surface dies, can you reboot the surface and still continue to pass audio uh, during that time? The S6L surface you're talking? Correct. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah, you sure can. Never, yeah. <laughs> never yep. tried it. I hope I never although, get there. But I'll give you one hint here. I just give you a little S6L tip. Uh, although, you know, typically if your surface crashes, you couldn't get to the software to reboot it using the options page, right? So the, the point is, don't reboot it there. Go and actually cold reboot it Okay. at the back. Just turn off the power supplies and turn them back on again, and that entire system will continue to pass audio. Uh, it's, Wonderful. It's one of the reasons, um, one of the reasons that we moved I.O. off of the engines. Uh, you remember in the previous... Uh, venue products, you know, there was a lot of I.O. on the engines and a lot of guys would drive their PA system from that I.O. And it made it, well, impossible to reboot the engine and the surface there to get it going. You know, you were going to lose audio, no doubt about it. Now, I will give you this caveat here. Keep in mind, we did not have audio driving the PA system from the console. Like we didn't use any of the local I.O. to drive audio to the PA system. It all came from a Dante card that was sitting in the stage racks, right? So if you have audio coming from the local I.O. of the console up to the PA system, you're going to lose that audio as soon as you shut off the console, right? So that's why I almost, unless I have to do it, I almost religiously push audio out of the stage racks uh, to drive the PA system. So so keep that in mind. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I wanted to be able to demonstrate that here, but I don't have the right output cards in my stage rack here to do it. But uh Stick with me. I'll probably come up with a way to do it here before long and be able to show it to you. I've been promising the sound image guys. I've been going to show them that for ages. I'm waiting, still waiting on the cards. All right. Uh, so yeah, let's keep going here. 
So uh, this is another way that I've seen S3LX used in S6L land. Uh, and this was on Black Sabbath, if I remember. Uh, Greg Price was doing this. And, you know, if you're in a situation where you're less than 64 inputs, then you could just put a, re a fully redundant console on an analog splitter, right? You could just take a split right to it, which is what Greg was doing, and have that console sitting out there ready to go and have it be completely independent of the SXL at that point, right? I mean, it's not relying on the engine or anything to output uh, to stage racks or anything there. He just literally built a second mix on the S3L uh, that mimicked what he was doing on the S6L. Same plugins, same kind of everything. Now, it probably, I mean, Greg's not a, a super big plugin user anyway, so I think he was able to probably build something on S3L that was actually very close to what he was doing on the S6L. Uh, but I, I watched him change this over once at a sound check. I was like, wow, man, that's impressive. I mean, it sounded really good coming off the S S3L. You know, so, I mean, that was a really a really uh, comprehensive redundancy scheme for him. So you could certainly do this as well, you know. So not a problem. And still, like as you notice here, that's still a gain-shared S6L system. It's just gain-shared with an analog splitter there, right? All right, so let's just talk about some, let's throw down some best practices here and just some thoughts about doing this. And I've kind of said it for concert sound because uh, I think it's one of the more challenging places to do it. But you can use this kind of mindset in all the things that you're, uh, that you're talking about doing a redundancy for here. So the first one is certainly that the simplest plan will always be the most reliable one to implement under fire, right? Got to remember, you got to be able to do this under fire got to be able to do it under pressure. So don't make it so complex that you, you know, you create more trouble for yourself just getting audio going. You know, you may, you're not going to have to stay there for a month and a half. You got to stay there for until you get the console back up. Right. And I, you know, I don't want to speak too much for the audience members, but I would say most audiences would accept any sound coming out of the PA rather than silence while you're rebooting. You know, that'll keep them going. I, you know, they'll be kind of wondering, wow, man, it doesn't sound as good anymore. Whatever. At least they aren't throwing chairs. Okay, so let's, let's keep it all in perspective here. Uh, but it speaks to this idea of build what will work and build what you need to get you by, right? Uh, and, you know, kind of look for the most susceptible points of failure in your system to build redundancy. Now, this is kind of a system-wide thought. Uh, but I kind of think that way with S6L as well. Probably the most volatile piece of the system is the surface, not the engine, not the stage racks. I mean, those are pretty, pretty straightforward and can, you know, can do uh, a lot on their own. So I just really was concerned about making redundancy for the control surface when that was going on, you know. So, uh, but I think it's a good, good mindset to have whatever you're doing, right, uh, is look for the most susceptible points. You're not going to be able to make every single point of your system redundant. We can't hang a spare PA system. We can't, you know, I mean, it kind of speaks to that idea of you can make the redundancy so complex that it actually makes it uh, susceptible to failure, right? <clears throat> Duplicate systems are not always the most effective for redundancy. I, I would use, you know, mirrored engines as the example here. Even with a mirrored engine, if the control surface goes down, you're no better off. Right, I, I, you know, you only the only thing a mirrored engine is going to do for you is really keep the engine in play, and then you're going to have to have some way for that mirrored engine to automatically readdress I/O as well. So everybody kind of always wants to think of this mirrored engine concept as being the all all encompassing savior. Uh, it's only a limited, uh, limitedly so, you know, unless you want to have another surface on and another uh, a, a complete duplicate system in play. But then you know you've got to come up with some way. For it to track your changes and stay up to speed, et cetera. Again, the complexity of that goes up dramatically, right? So uh, let's keep in mind what we want to be able to do. Now, if I was building redundancy for the Super Bowl broadcast, then yeah, I all, all bets are off, right? I'm going to build to the nth degree there. I want to have every base covered there uh, that I can. Yeah, Scott, go ahead. Uh, this may be a stupid question, but with all the like the routing that I'm seeing for your redundancy and everything, what's the why couldn't you just? I mean, I'm a you know keep it simple type of guy. 
why couldn't you just like with the use of cat five cables and stuff, just daisy chain two consoles and two racks and that kind of stuff, you know, regardless of which one goes down, you've got the other one there that, you know, if, if one stage rack goes down, well, then you've got that other stage rack and that other console you could just jump to if you're bringing extra consoles like that versus doing all this stuff like this, or am I missing something? It has to do with the maximum number of node points in your ABB network. I think in that situation, you would want to go, I mean, you could, you could certainly gain share a second system uh, in those stage racks and kind of keep them both together, right? You could maybe take some MIDI out of one system into the other control surface, would follow your snapshots along. Uh, I, it would be tracking your changes as you go. But, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, what you're talking about there is something for only the elite tours that are going to pay for an extra console to be out there strictly for redundancy, right? I mean, that's a, that's a big expense over the course of a tour. Well, right. I mean, I, I know other, other, you know, even like smaller acts like Goo Goo Dolls took out two Midas. It's like they took out a Pro, uh, Pro 2, Pro 2 or Pro 2C as their backup off of a, you know, from a uh, Pro X, I believe. Mm -hmm. Both ends, but I was just wondering if you could just you know daisy chain the consoles and just mirror them. I mean, because like you can link two computers together. That way, if one computer goes down, you've got that one there. You can just make a couple changes on the plugs and go. No, not quite that simple, I'm afraid. Um, can't just daisy chain it all together. That is for sure. So, a lot of communication taking place there that would get really, really confused, wondering why there's two control surfaces and two engines on the same network there. You know. Even with the AB loop system? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, let's, and that's kind of what I'm getting at. You can kind of gain share it there, uh, where you're using a common set of stage racks and be able to do that. Then, then the infrastructure would be there to do that. <clears throat> and that, that might get, well, no mites about it. That would get easier once we were at Starpoint Network, right? Then you can add another surface and another engine there uh, and have them, have them track along. But at some point, you know, you've got to find a way to, I, I'm just running it through my head right now, how you would actually say that the second surface is now directing outputs, physical outputs now. You would, you would, I guess you would have to have it always directing physical outputs and then make the change downstream before it gets to the PA of which console is driving the PA system. You follow me there? Yes and no. I guess I'm just looking at it as like if you can run like a like a, a front of house and a monitor console through a splitter. Well, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. I, that's what it would require. It would require you either to gain share or put them on a splitter. But you, yeah, oh, so you, have, you have a splitter in in like basically at front of house where we'll be splitting to two separate consoles. Well, no, it would have to happen down at the stage rack area because that second console has got to get audio from somewhere. Well, okay, right. If you left your stage racks there, but I was just going off of other ways that I hooked things up. But okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could do it. I, I, I just don't. Well, I, and maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But I would just think the expense of that. You would never get that to fly with most artists. I, I know. <laughs> I know. If I would have gone to Petty's production team and said, "Yeah, we're going to spend an extra five grand a week for consoles and splitters to be out there just in case the initial one fails, the answer would have been, you didn't, then you need to get a different console. So, Right. All right, so let's move on in the redundancy considerations. Try to accommodate a backup plan that includes analog as well as digital. You kind of saw that in my scheme there where uh, you know, we're actually using analog outputs and inputs to avoid you know, reclock and things like that while, while you're switching back and forth. Nothing wrong with analog there. Uh, and this kind of, maybe this speaks to what Scott was talking about here. You know, I, I like to think, resist the temptation to design your redundancy that is so comprehensive that it, you can't verify it. On, you don't have enough time to verify it on a day-to-day. -day. And worst case, it would actually destabilize the entire system, you know, so. And I would think, even for as confident as I am with gain sharing, right, to me, having a gain shared system on there strictly for redundancy is adding risk to the network there you know i who knows what's going to go on there uh, i mean i feel confident it would go on and work for a period of time but it, is that a necessary risk would be my question so given what else you could do with redundancy maintain the fundamental goal of your redundancy design right little to no silence silence is the killer here better to keep audio of any quality going until you can get back up to speed 
Uh, so let that be kind of your guide and build back from that. Matter of fact, I, I think probably a good mindset would be uh, design maybe, how do I even say it? I don't want to say the least desirable, but the simplest redundancy first and verify that and make sure it's acceptable and then try to make it better from there. That way you've always got that one to fall back on if you need it, right? And then finally, and this is probably the most important one, I, I see this one uh, and have to fight for this even when I'm on shows, uh, like award shows and things like that, fight for this time. And this is the idea that your redundancy plan does not exist, right? If you have not um, checked it and rehearsed the changeover, right? It just is no, almost no point in having it there if you can't rehearse it and verify that it actually works. Uh, because I'm just telling you, when that PA goes off and everybody's sphincter gets a little tighter, all of a sudden those, those moves that you thought, oh, that'll be easy, I'll just do that, those moves are not so easy anymore. And thinking gets complicated and thinking gets confused very, very easily. So you have to rehearse it. I, 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 I mean, I said it earlier, and it's the same mindset. You know, if you have a spare vocal mic laying on stage for your vocalist, it's not a spare vocal mic until you've verified that it actually works. Right, and that it's actually patched in and it's at the right level and all of those things. Right, So you have to find time to do this on a day-to-day. -day. And we have a beautiful way of doing that now with virtual sound check. I mean, you can actually work on your redundant scheme and get it sounding really good so that you can change over to it as opposed to just thinking, well, boy, I hope that monitor guy sends me something good out here You know, when we get this going on. He just goes to playback and we build that mix right there. Right, so, No, more bass, more bass drum, more vocal, whatever you're going to be, just drive him right to it. Okay. All right. So uh, with that in mind, let's have the discussion, right? Let's, uh, let's see what you guys have got. You've seen how I've done it here. And that redundancy scheme is not far off uh, what I try to promote to people, uh, you know, if I'm on award shows or whatever. But that, that would be certainly what I would do on tour, some variation of that on tour for sure. So. Who wants to go first? Sean Sullivan. I knew he was going to be in here. I, I knew I could count on him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a very similar approach that you do to it uh, with just different gear. Like I have uh, uh, for my backup, I basically have a, a Waves, uh, you know, their little LV1 console is what I use as my backup console in front of house. And I get the signal from it. Your audio is way low, man. Audio. Yeah, Sully, your, your audio is low, and it feels almost like it's being gated or something. Is that possible? Yep. Yeah, How about now? Like some can, you, kind of can you hear it now? That's better. Is that better now? So I use LV1. Again, you and didn't check, Sean? I did check it. We did check it. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Uh, I just must have been further from the microphone. Uh, so my primary input to LV1 is the Matty out of the S6L stage rack through an MGB. Uh, that way I get very similar sounding preamps and blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's the first and foremost way to get to the LV1. The second is, like you said earlier, with stems from the monitor console that are analog inputs that are sent via copper all the way to front of house because I have a part of my I.O. scheme for the LV1 is my basically the, the I.O. to get to an LM44 out of the LV1 has got 16 analog inputs on it. So I send copper from monitor rig with stems, vocals, direct. Uh, and then, and, and that goes into the LM44s on an analog input where the main S6L is, is Dante, like you're doing, same way. I also have AES and analog because I use three LM44s in front of house. So I have lots of IO to get in and out of it. Uh, so I have the LV1 has got strictly analog into it, but I also have a left, right from the monitor console that goes straight to the, to the LM44 to drive the PA. Now, that being said, the LM44 has no real redundancy, does it? You know, if the LM44s go bad, then you're kind of stuck. But over the years, I've been using these things for 15 years now. They pretty much, they've, they're one of the most reliable pieces. I've never, knock on wood, I've never had an LM44 failure. Yeah. Uh, I think the consoles are usually the first thing to not work out. You know, something goes wrong in there. And this ancillary stuff, the little tiny things usually work the best, which is kind of odd. The most important piece is the one you have the problem with. Yeah. But well, by, by comparison, are, you know, I mean, they're, by comparison, the LM44 is simple compared to a console, right? And I mean, it's 
that's pretty predictable hardware to be able to use. I, I'm kind of in the same boat with you. I, I don't think I've ever had an LM44 failure. You know, so, uh, you know, we're, we're relying on primary and redundant network schemes there within Dante as well as the analog digital uh, inputs. That feels pretty safe to me. Nothing's 100% foolproof, but that feels And I have, safe. you know, I have redundant smart rigs. I have two, you know, two Mac minis that run smart in case one goes bad. I have two Mac Pro trash cans that are recording my S6L. I also have another Mac Mini that's recording with tracks live, so I can do virtual sound check on the LV1. Uh, and like you said, every day during sound check, even if I only get one song, I'll unmute that L LV1 in my LM44 and listen to it because you know it might be a week since I listened to it because we haven't done a show, and who knows what's changed. You know? right. So you always gotta you always gotta be confident that it's gonna work right. The only way to do that is to check it and listen to it. Yep. I mean, it's, honestly, in my situation, that's why I like using the stem outputs to go to that extra mixer because I know it's always going to be where I am on S6L, right? I mean, I, it's not like I'm remixing a complete input set over there. It's the actual groups that I, you know, that are at the position and at the the mixes that I left when the console shut down. So, uh, so yeah. Who else has got one? Who else got a, a scheme they want to share? Is, I'm sorry, Sully, were you done there? Or, didn't mean to cut you off. So. Uh, sorry, I don't hear you there, buddy. I see you talking, but I don't hear you. Uh, maybe somebody else talk and make sure we got stream audio here. I still hear I hear you. I just don't hear nice. something. Yeah. And I hear you. Go yep. to the backup mic, Sully. Go to the backup mic. The analog mic. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel Ferry says, we sure had, uh, certainly had Dolby failures through the years, uh, or, or failures though, yeah, which, uh, I, you know, I'll take your word on it. I, I never really used those Dolby units very much. I, they weren't part of my system designs, but sure looked like a good box. Yeah, I'll say on my perspective, I never really f experienced any network failures as such, mostly just equipment failure, consoles and such. I'm not going to name brands, but uh, luckily it wasn't a show breaker. It was towards the end of a show, mm -hmm. and we noticed meters weren't moving, but the audio was still coming out. Interesting. So we just let it be. Yeah. <laughs> let the guests walk out. If you can still and, hear it, don't mess with yeah, it. <laughs> just don't, let's go have another drink, and let's let it be. And that was about as the only failure i could think of in terms of a showstopper that could have been right right well i mean there's certainly um, been some out there and you know uh, mm -hmm. i mean we live in this age of it for sure i mean you know some of the failures are well documented in the world out there so you know you gotta have gotta have ways around it gotta have some safety nets built in there well, somewhere. i keep not i keep knocking on wood this whole seminar today because i can count so many times that things could have yeah. really gone awful awfully bad Usually internationally. I know, I know you can <laughs> you know, blame it on, on a couple of international type of circumstances. You know, like in Sardinia, they don't know about snakes and things like that. Right. right. And so it was interesting. But, we I found mean, that's, one snake that worked. That's a good one. You know, I mean, how many times have I gone out with a vendor on a show and had no extra runs of Cat 5 in a snake? You know? yep. It's like, what? Mm -hmm. Come on, man. You got, you got to at least have one extra run here, you know? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Sean says he's unmuted and can see meters, but uh, no audio. I don't know what to tell you there, brother. We're just going to keep the show going until you're back online. Anybody else got their uh, some redundancy schemes they want to share? share uh, Fred, I, I'm going to call you out here. How do you? Uh, Fred's a broadcast engineer. He's a broadcast mixer for Fox Sports here in and around this region. What do, you, what do you do for redundancy in your schemes? Um, like I said, when I don't do it so much anymore, but um, in the beginning when we got this latest truck that we're in, they have a rack mount mixer up on the ceiling. <laughs> and basically I just run all the announcer mics and my two bat crack mics for baseball um, into there and then just take the inserts out and bring them into the console. And if for some reason the system would go down, I just take the left right outs, patch them in the transmission or some sort of DAs, which feed transmission, 
and then I'd have I'd have an aux bus already set up for the IFBs, and they would all just get the same mix. It wouldn't nobody would get their custom mixes that I give everybody during a show. Right. Uh, it would basically be an all for one kind of a thing, and it, you know, in the time it would take me to throw ten patch cords. Yeah, and you. So in your situation, the broadcast another broadcast mixer is actually handling handling all the video audio and stingers and stuff like that. Is that right? No. No, you I you handle all of this. I do everything, yeah. and I feed all of my stuff to the other people. So usually the visiting show, and then if ESPN or Turner or somebody comes in, I give them all of my or NHK. They come in and you know the Japanese players. Um, I give them all kinds of things. They come in and want <laughs> hot mics and certain mixes. I'm like, okay, well, no big deal. We got Dante <laughs> or uh, we got Maddie. Here you go. Here you go. You have a fifty six or sixty four channels. Oh, 64. Okay, good. You're good here. Um, unfortunately, some of the trucks in the MTVG fleet with the Yamaha consoles, they can only take 56 channels, but of course we're all set up for 64 and the Calrec boxes, they have a switch on the front of them. You can switch it from 64 to 56. I guess the, as extra eight channels in Yamaha land, they use that for some other kind of data. Got it. How about, uh, any monitor guys in here? I, I'm really fascinated to know how monitor guys deal with this, or if they even deal with it. You know, is there any kind of redundancy in your system designs? You know, uh, the times that I do do monitors, which have been, uh, well, with them still kind of sometimes. Rob Killenberger ended up getting the job, but I was the monitor engineer for uh, Little Steven before he went out on the road. And then up until before the pandemic, I was filling in with the Fab Fo. Um, you know, I can't say that we've had any failures or anything like that. And to be honest, that was one of the things I was really terrified when you mentioned it. Yeah. Because I really wouldn't even know how to begin. Yeah, it's and just, I always... It's a standard, it's a standard Yamaha workflow. Uh, nothing special about it. But to be perfectly honest, a show like that, I really wouldn't know where to be, even start. Yeah, yeah. It's extremely complex, you know, they're, you know, you're used to that sort of thing where musicians change around song. Songs are never the same. Uh, they change positions. Somebody changes here. Somebody goes there. There's, uh, uh, you know, star vocals, guest vocals, all the stuff. And, um, yeah, I was thinking I, it started making me think about that sort of thing because I have no recourse. I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking in S6L land, you know, you would be saved by the idea that audio is still passing out of the stage racks if you have to restart the surface as long Correct. as you're not sourcing audio from the surface you know those ear mixes mm -hmm. would go on you would lose control but at least they right. would they would continue audio if you had to reboot the surface you know oh i got some excellent insight from today for sure i appreciate that yeah so i got one uh, yeah, from i'm a monitor guy and have zero backup <laughs> <laughs> I, I've had faders go bad during the middle of a show and was able to sort of change my layout during the show, but that's the most I've had to do. Right. We got a text in from, uh, or a chat in from Scott Fahey. Uh, it says he can't talk because he's in a public place right now listening, but he says, uh, monitor guy here, everyone is on ears. If things go down, they just pull their ears out and go old school and listen to the main PA. So they just try time travel back to 1968. It's not a problem. I mean, what's the big deal? Yeah, I've seen that a lot. With Groban, we had a second PM1, but I, I, I've been on five or six in the last 10 years, and there's no backup, and it always surprises the hell out of me. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I'm here to start the conversation, not necessarily end it. Uh, but, boy, I think if I was in that situation... I would have something as a safety net. Something. Uh, here's another chat in. Let me just read through it, and then I'll share it with everybody. Uh, yeah, so it says, I did a gig where we attempted merging uh, in backup mixes from the front of house console, uh, in, parenth or, yeah, in parentheses, Digico desk. Uh, but the front of house desk has to take over the output cards, which is an, I an ideal situation for a seamless transition. Yeah, yeah, I can see where that could be a problem. Uh, just trying to think if there's an easy way to do that. Hey, Robert, the other thing I forgot to mention was um, 
on the on the broadcast side. My Maddie is generally coax, and you can run that into a video DA and give that same Maddie stream to everybody. Yeah, and they just pick off the channels that they need. Um, when you have a fiber, obviously it's just a point to point. But on a but on a coax, you can throw it into a video DA and have twenty outputs if you want. Right, right. Just just it just becomes distributed Maddie at that point, right? So uh, a guy named Eric Schramm says that Eddie Capo, Gwen Stefani, and Enrique's monitor guy is going to come online. So we'll, we'll patiently wait for him. I'll watch for him to enter the room. Uh, Scott is asking, what about front of house latency, though? Have you have, have seen a few tours take small analog desks with vital inputs and pump to a couple backup wedges and packs? Yeah, I mean, why not? I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at. I think if I was uh, on the hook for a big show and I was mixing monitors, I would certainly have some sort of, you know, uh, emergency scheme there. You know, be able to get into triage and say, okay, we got to have this. Let's let's make sure everybody can have that and go to work. So yeah, certainly a good question. I, I was just kind of I was as the other question was coming in, I was trying to think if there's a way in the gain sharing scheme in our system to be able to better handle that where you could actually because we got i mean front of house system is going to have an abundance of uh, auxiliaries available to it i'm just wondering if you could create a second set of aux mixes and just have them address the output racks like just take you know if that if that system went down let's say it completely failed then you could take those auxes and drive them out of the outputs that were previously owned by the monitor console and be have everybody's ears working. That might be that might be doable. Let's kind of look into that. Matter of fact, we're gonna make a note on that. And on the Digico desk, those output cards have to be specifically allocated. Uh, they do here as well, but uh, you can give up or, or take ownership from them at either position. You know, you can uh, kind of just say, hey, I want to become the owner of that rack right now or that output card right now. And uh, I, I, I want to say you might have to get permission from the other console, but that's what I'm going to look into here. So. I run into that sometimes dealing with the Yamaha. Some, somehow the Yamaha takes control of my channel and I can't do anything. Yeah. I got a feeling that's probably going to be the case here. But it might be worth, uh, you know, putting some brain cells behind that and thinking, you know, maybe trying to design something in there that would be able to do that. Uh, Whitson Williams, you're saying that is doable. Uh, is that referring to the post that is directly above you there? And you got you guys are welcome to come on no, my I'm, mic and talk about this if you want. So I'm, refer I'm referring to the their concept of the. Because front of house, all especially for the avids, they have massive amount of auxiliaries that that are just laying around. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so that's that's a nice idea. You know, the uh, the cool thing that you could do there. Let's see, could that would that actually work? No, that wouldn't work. Sorry, I was good. think I thought I had a a hot shot idea there for a second, but that wouldn't exactly work. Uh, got another guy, another one from Lord Christopher here that says front of house theater guy here. With my Soundcraft VI7000, I had a laptop with the offline editor running a copy of my show file ready to be connected to a local rack if needed. Also did practice the changeover during rehearsal. So in that situation, uh, if I can ask the question here, so you can actually have standalone software take control of the VI7000 engine. Is that the idea there? Yeah, okay. That's pretty cool. That's a pretty neat idea. That would certainly work as a good uh, backup for your, uh, you know, for your control surface, I would think. Might not be the funnest thing to mix the show on, but it would certainly give you some access. Might be, it would certainly give you access to be able to unmute and mute channels that needed it as you go along in the show, which would be a big plus there. Yamaha sure. can do that too. Is that right? Yeah. That's kind of a neat idea. You know, I and I, I'm going to say... Uh, well, I hope I don't get people in trouble here. I'll bet you any amount of money we could do that with our standalone software, too. I just don't think we've made the provision to do it. Because uh, I, I think I've seen Ryan John doing something very similar to that. Might be worth checking that, too. Let me just 
Yeah, I think I'm going to have to ask someone to check it out in the shop too. I think Yamaha's definitely could run that way. I'm pretty sure is, it can, yeah. There is uh, a provision in the software that allows you to either the software um, control the console or vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. I've had to do it, unfortunately. Okay. I've had to do it. And that's funny. That brings up another thing I saw earlier. Someone put a post in another group where they had a touch screen and they mapped it somehow to work such a, like an LV one. Yeah. So they could use faders and such. Well, I know we could, do, I mean, uh, the, uh, the reason I'm kind of thinking this probably would work is that I know right now, you know, you can obviously use VNC or you could use the iPad app here to mix on the console through the VNC port, but or I mean, uh, through the ECX port. Uh, but that, you know, if you had to reboot your console, that EC export, you lose service there. So. so there needs to be a way for it to connect to the rack instead. Yeah, you need to be able to connect it directly to the engine and replicate the surface. Yeah, yeah. Not a bad idea. Not a, not a bad thing. No. no, not at all. Let's see. So Scott Fahey says, pretty sure you can do it with... Oh, wait a minute. Let me get back up and make sure... Sorry, I'm just going to kind of go through these chats. You guys can kind of see these chats, so I don't necessarily have to read them. Uh, yeah, and I can't speak about SSL because I haven't been there for a long time. Right. But I wouldn't be surprised if they were thinking about something like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's smart. I mean, to me, that's that's kind of a, from an engineering point of view, that's a relatively easy thing to do, you know, especially if you've got the standalone software built and it's built off of your control software anyway, you know, that's that's not a lot of hoops to jump through to be able to do that, I wouldn't think. So. But, well, you, know, you know, I don't want from, to be guilty of... Having, no, no, but for having, I mean, having had work there, uh, it, it, at least when I was there, it was a smaller company. Um, they literally had maybe 15 designers. So getting anything through to get work done was a, a very big endeavor. We were urged to keep a list of, you know, all my users' best or top 10 list of yeah. demands and you know, i'm usually familiar with that but to get that through was just a really big 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 endeavor it's and nothing uh, really got through i'll just speak directly to that i've been doing that for over 15 years now it's the hardest job on the planet is to prioritize feature sets hardest job on the planet because you want them all and it's exactly you, and it's not just a matter of kind of waiting, well, which one's going to be the easiest to make? Can we get that one? Which one's going to right. be the hardest? You've got to weigh in there. Which one of them are going to actually help you sell consoles? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's that's ultimately what you they know. think of. And, you know, you got to think that way as well. Yeah, and you got to respect that. I, you know, as it mm -hmm. was put to me very, very early on in my days of digital design, right after I first got there, was, mm -hmm. look, we're not in the job of making cool shit. We're, we're, our job is we're to sell money. cool no. shit, you know? <laughs> exactly. So, you know, mm -hmm. just keep it, in, keep it reined in here, you know? So exactly. You, you, you had to fight very hard for features that you wanted to get in there. You had to rationalize them really Yes, strongly. we did. So. <laughs> well, they all have gotten better, so I'm glad. I remember getting my uh, first tour of the SL6 with Ryan in 2015. It was really cool. Yeah, yeah. Here's another one from uh, about the PM10. They had a PM10 crash. Uh, but said, fortunately, the house staff had a computer running the same software as the console, uh, and they were able to finish the show mixing from the laptop. So, yeah, that's that's a cool workflow. That's certainly better than nothing. That is for sure. So, yeah, you know, when we get these systems that have distributed engines and distributed I.O., that's obviously one of the big pluses of that right there, you know. I would think in that situation, and you guys that have been chiming in there, please let me know here. Uh, well, the PM10 was designed with that more in mind. Yeah, uh, being able to be um, independent of of you know surface or anything else. And in fact, they had one of the attractive features was that we could mix my monitor guy and myself on the same surface and not be on any on on each on each other's way. Right. right. We never did get to do it, but it seemed like a really cool thing, and it sold us on having that particular uh, series on all our riders. On the uh, since you've been on it, uh, Dennis, is the PM one hundred and ten is the is the engine separate from the surface there? It can be. I, I mean, is it, you can, it you, is it powered separately from the surface? It is not. No, you, it's the surface itself controls. Obviously, it's a control surface, but you can uh, you know command 
the, the processing anywhere you wanted to. I, I mean, my thinking is and, you wouldn't be yeah, able to and, reboot and, the surface then if the engine is attached to the, the power. No, the engines place. are the engines in the rack for the ten. For the seven, it's the in seven the is correct. The seven is smaller, and I, and I think the five is also doing that too. No, the five and three are both in the rack again. Okay. The new, the right. new five and three are in the rack. Uh, so seven's the only one that's in the console. So the seven has got... has the engine integrated to the surface. Then is that right? Yep. yep. Okay. Right. Good to know. Uh, let's see, I'm just going to read another one here. Maybe did something. Oh, ouch, that sounds like a horrible failure. Uh, it's so painful to read some of those sometimes. So it says, if you, Samuel Ferry says, if you drive the PA from the stage rack, you can reboot the PM10 surface and have audio continue to pass. That must uh, well. That's that's got to be because the engine is separate from the surface, right? Yeah, that it use external engines. Yeah, I got to believe that's the case there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I mean, it looks like uh, a good chunk of the consoles out there at least have some sort of safety net uh, in terms of laptop control. So that's kind of cool. Uh, is there a backup mode like D Show uh, Venue Head? There is not a backup personality in SXL. Uh, but like I said, you can reboot the surface uh, and it will come back through boot stages just like the old venue systems did. But we, we don't retain fader control during that process right now. Uh, we've considered putting it back in, uh, but we have not done it. So that has been under consideration a couple of times, whether we wanted to put backup personality back in here. Uh, much, much more challenging to do on SXL, honestly, because it's you know, in the original venue systems, that control surface, and they hate me for saying this, but it's the truth, that control surface was a mouse. You know, I mean, it was a tactile pointing device, essentially, for all intents and purposes. S6L control surface is not that. It is network processing modules. So the idea of being able to put together uh, backup personality there is much more complex. Uh, so Sean, does audio that is sent, uh, there is no audio, uh, I'll read the question. Does audio that sent from one E192 engine continue to pass while the surface restarts? Uh, so I just want to be clear, and I, I know you know this, but I'm just going to say it uh, for those that don't know it. The 192 engine has no audio outputs on it, but it addresses the audio, uh, audio devices, the stage racks, etc. cetera. Uh, so the short answer is yes. Uh, whatever audio is built on the control surface and provided by the engine to the stage racks, that audio will continue while you reboot the surface. But that said, you have to, if you're going to reboot that surface, you got to do it as a cold start doing it. Don't do it as a software restart. Otherwise it'll mute the outputs on the stage rack. Right. Uh, Mark Morris, I see you sent that privately, but that's okay. I'll answer it if you want. Are you talking about the show in Seattle? What was the, oh, what was the longest silence you had, Robert, in a show? I'm sorry. I, I misread it. I'm sorry. Uh, no, just in general. Longest silence I've had at a show. Memory banks. Memory banks. Longest one I had at a show was probably, <laughs> although it wasn't total silence because the band just kept playing through it, uh, was probably Def Leppard in 1988-89 where I had, uh, I was mixing on Soundcraft Series 4 and had a roof above my mixing console basically split open and completely, I mean, it was that console couldn't have been wetter if you'd have thrown it in a swimming pool. Uh, and w believe it or not, it kept running. I, I, I mean, I couldn't believe it just didn't blow a breaker and turn it off, but it kept running. But there were only two outputs actually working on the console. And luckily, I had a headphone amp with me, and it just happened to be two auxiliaries that were right next to each other so they could be operated in stereo. Uh, so I just put all of the channels in 
uh, post fader for that aux and mixed through that aux to the PA system. But it took me about uh, it took me about 10, 12 minutes to get that going, and had the entire band of Aerosmith guys standing right next to me watching me do it. That made it even more fun. So there you go. So that that was fun. I think probably close next closest one to that was probably Seattle. Uh, with Petty, where we had, uh, and I, I feel even terrible saying it, uh, but we had an A2 accidentally readdress an entire networked PA system. We had to wait for it to completely readdress, and it muted it while it did it. So it was a painful situation, but uh, it was just a human error. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to the chat here. We'll go a couple more minutes here, and then I think we can probably knock it on head unless you guys come up with any big revelations here. Um, makes sense, like Matty cards, Waves cards. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Sean, I'll, I'll answer your question here. Uh, Matty cards and Waves cards. I would say those should continue to pass audio. That's all happening in that engine, right? I'll try it. I'll, I'll give it a shot here. Maybe I'll make this as part of my experiment I'm putting together for sound image and make sure the same thing. But I would believe that those Matty cards uh, and those Waves cards would continue to pass audio in that situation. What's your thinking in not using a split rack? Not using uh, an actual splitter? Correct. Oh, just ease of, ex or, uh, not as expensive, uh, certainly better sound quality. I mean, I get it's another failure point pot or potential failure point, let's say. But Well, it's a more encompassing failure point. If you have a stage rack fail, then it fails for everybody on the network, not just the connect console is connected to. So you've got to balance that against it for sure. Uh, it's a more complex system than a splitter for sure. But I like having a lot less analog lines there. That is for sure. I mean, that part of it never, I, I mean, I've, I did two complete tours using our gain sharing system and we never had a burp out of it, you know. Once we got the early portion of virtual sound check sorted out with it and, and how that was all going to work, but they, for the mic splitting portion of it back into both consoles, that worked like a charm, man. I, we never had an issue there. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read this from Bobby Brick and Breckenridge, because it's absolutely excellent and right. Um, the Climbing and Mountaineering World publishes a yearly journal of accidents so that people can learn from worst-case scenarios. I feel like the live sound industry could do the same thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I am 100% on board with you there. Now, uh, you know... Obviously, in the mountain and climbing world, uh, mountaineering and climbing world, there are people's lives involved here. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm all for it there. I would say to you, uh, as gracefully as I can, I think there's a bunch of manufacturers that might have a real problem with that. Uh, but do I think it still should be done? Yes, I do. Yes, I certainly do. Uh, <laughs> so maybe we'll take, maybe we as a group should take that on, you know. Uh, start logging some of these events. Uh, you know, if we can keep the marketing departments out of play, you know, spinning why something happened, then you might get some real, uh, some real information there <laughs> with all names redacted. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Oh man! Well, the thing is, most of us know each other anyway, so we're going to hear the story. What's the pro? You know, what's the point? Well, yeah. That, well, there's truth in that, and that actually may be part of the problem, not just the solution, because. I, you know, there, I mean, even my situation in Seattle there, I knew what happened during that. And by the time I got back to the hotel, the Internet was already full of people that knew what happened, which were all wrong. They were all completely wrong. You know, they, they decided they knew how we should be doing the redundancy in the system and that what went wrong and all this stuff. I was like, OK, well, you don't really you don't really have any of your facts right there. You're just speculating. So, yeah, there is that part of it. Uh, I did have another uh, one time when uh, I was working with, uh, you know, the um, those Christmas specials that they do every year. Yeah. I worked as a music editor for the one with Carrie Underwood. 
And mm-hmm. I remember they had two days they stopped production because someone ran over the two redundant Maddie lines that went to the record trucks. And they didn't have anything because this was out in Long Island on the uh, sound stages. And they had to get stuff from, um, what's the company? PRG, I think it was. Yeah. And until it came, we couldn't do anything. So it was two days of ouch waiting around. Yeah, that was a ouch. lot of people standing around. That's a lot of money right there. Woo. Oh yeah, man. Mm. It was it was right by my station too. It was great to see. Yeah. Uh, Julia, I can't pronounce your last name. I'm sorry there. McShane. I, I'm gonna guess it's McShane. Are you did doing? <laughs> did I get it? You did. Nice. Uh, are you doing your redundancy testing during live sound check or virtual? Uh, I, in in the situation with Petty, we only did it virtual because there there was no live sound check. We never did live sound check. But uh, I would just say to you, if virtual sound check is valid enough for you to do it uh, in the first place, it's certainly valid enough to check your redundancy as well. So uh, if you can do it that way, by all means, do it. The only place re- the virtual sound check wouldn't re- work to check your redundant scheme is if you had a second console on a splitter, right? Then you have no sources into that console unless they're live sources. So, uh, you know, just be aware. That's, that's one of the downsides of that, I guess. What are other people doing? I, you know, I don't know is the honest answer. I don't know if I really know. That's part of the reason I put this lab together. I was hoping to find out some info from some people on what they're doing. So, uh and- yeah. yeah, the other thing I wanted to know is how much time do you actually allow for it? Because if you have a set of time, do you want to make sure that you get that or are you focusing on your mix? Well, if I've, I, I mean, if I'm checking it day to day, I mean, honestly, that, that check takes five minutes at most. And I, and I would always make it the last thing I do before I wake, walk away from the console. You know, so if I, whether I'm in live sound check or virtual sound check, whatever, if, as soon as I'm done with that, really it's about rehearsing, okay, are all the outputs that I think need to make it to the redundant mixer making it? Let's line check it at input. And then can I get the outputs of that redundant mixer to the PA system? And let's, let's go back and forth here and listen to the difference in levels and make sure it's not too disruptive if we go to the redundant scheme. And like I said, once you check that, once or twice and get it set, then it's just a matter of re-verifying it every day. It doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out process there once you get it going. Uh, but to go without checking it, oof, I don't, I don't, I would, that's, that would, uh, I would say this. I'll, I'll go on a limb and say this. If we got into a situation where we had to go to the redundant system and it didn't work, or it was a very poor changeover, and I found out that my A2 did not check that during the day, he probably would not have a job going forward and maybe I should fire myself there because like I said I, I would demand that we check it before I ever walked away from the console so uh, you know because I'm going to be the one set to mix it I would want to see it in play so hopefully that answers your question there yeah you're Thanks. pretty much using snapshots every song yeah yeah but I, you know that's you sacrifice that at that moment like I said you know well, you're not wise. what's Can that you link yeah, can you link the 6L and 3 on the snapshot so that at least it's advancing on the 3 with the 6? No, because the snapshots are completely different things there. Remember, you know, I'm going, I have stems going into the S3L there. So all the right. snapshots are going to be impacting inputs going to those stems. Uh, so there's yeah. snapshots in S3L are meaningless there, right? So, gotcha. Yep. Yeah. And, and once the console, Usually, if the console crashes, I mean, it's if, if it's a software issue, whatever it's going to be, uh, then the whole concept of snapshots is out the window. Anyway, you wouldn't be able to advance them anyway if it was if it was in crash mode. <laughs> Scott, are you starting that rumor? I, I got a feeling you're the one starting that rumor in the chat there. That we just need to lay hands on the console and thoughts and prayers. Is that what we're saying now? All right, well, we are 10 past the hour, and if anybody, unless anybody's got any big revelations of other things that they've heard of or done here, uh, we'll pull the plug here. But, uh, you know, if you guys want to submit stuff to the, uh, you know, if you come up with schemes, that, like I said, I don't care if you just draw them out on a napkin and take a picture of it, go ahead and post them up in the shared folder. 
let's let, you know we can carry on this conversation for quite a bit here if we want to do it. So I'll put the, the stuff I showed you today will be up in the folder today at some point. Uh, if you want to just look through that and ponder that. Um, but if you come up with other stuff and you want to draw it out and put it up there, maybe with a little explanation of it, by all means do so. But I'll leave you with this thought. There's a lot of job security in redundancy. So, uh, you know, make sure and come up with at least some sort of redundant scheme in your, in your work if you can do it. Okay. All right, fellas. All right, fellas. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Robert. Good Thank you, everybody. And yes, uh, Scott Taylor, I'll see you on Thursday, buddy. You, will, you bet. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, guys. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Have a good one. See you.